Hello, hello, it's time for another video, finally, so, <laughs> um, yeah, so anyway, this is the Intel Core Duo T2700 on a A-Open board, it's a i9-45 chipset, so pretty mid-range as far as mid-range goes, but it does the job, I would have preferred to have the i9-75 top-of-the-line model, but that's kind of unobtainium, since that's kind of a enthusiast board. Anyway, without further ado, let's go ahead and start it up. So, one of the interesting things about this board, you can see right there, Eco Quiet. That's actually the splash screen for a company called RM Education, if I remember correctly, from the UK. And they used these motherboards here for just a whole line of all-in-one desktop systems that they called the Eco Quiet series, which, you know, you kind of saw on the splash screen. And yeah, if you've been keeping up with my YouTube community posts, you would have seen that there's all sorts of weirdness involved with these boards specifically. And one of them is that they apparently use a customized evaluation ROM rather than a customized retail BIOS. And I'm not sure if that's actually the reason why there's some weirdness involving CPU detection or not. But either way, for whatever reason, my T2700 here gets registered as a engineering sample chip, even though it at least to me, appears like it clearly isn't. So anyway, I'm going to switch over fully to the video capture now instead. And just show you around a bit. And later on, we're going to be pairing it up with a very era-appropriate graphics card. So at the moment, it is working only with the built-in Intel integrated graphics. So let's just go ahead and open up CPU-Z in the meantime. Oh, what's Microsoft Security Essentials complaining about? Never mind, never mind. Oops, that is the wrong folder. That is in tools. There we go, CPU-Z. And yes, I've already dumped the BIOS, so I do plan on desoldering the BIOS chip to do one last dump to be safe. So we'll open that up, give it a moment. Okay, so here we go. We've got an Intel Core Duo T2700, which is a Yona core. This predates the actual, like literal core architecture. In this case, it was still just called core, but it was in reality more of an enhanced Pentium M design than anything that was as, di as distinct as it currently is now. So anyway, yeah, you can see this is a purely 32-bit CPU. There is no sign of x86-64 support here in the instructions. And the specifications ignore the ES there. We're running at 2.3 gigahertz stock with a bus speed of 166 megahertz, so we can change that in a moment here. Our memory, we are running it just barely faster than what it is normally rated for with timings of 56618. And it's just a pair of crucial sticks, DDR2 SODIMs, because this board is a mobile on desktop platform. Let's just do a quick CPU-Z benchmark run just to show you what it looks like when we are doing a stock run. And I'm not quite sure why, but single thread and multi-thread here both get almost the exact same score despite being a dual core CPU. So we get 80.4 and 80.9 respectively for single thread and multi-thread. But if we go ahead and open up set FSB here, run that, and slowly crank it up. 
I like to do it in roughly 10 megahertz increments, otherwise it starts to get unstable. If you go back over here, you can see the core speed is slowly ramping up now alongside the bus speed. So this board officially supports going up to 195 megahertz. If you try and go beyond that, it will not go any higher. So you can see here I've got 205 set, but the bus speed is only reading at around 195 or 196. So the fastest that we can possibly get is roughly 2.7 gigahertz. And now if we go back to CPU Z benching, we are scoring a good bit higher than we were before. 94.7 ish for multi-threaded. And also very close to that for single threaded. I haven't yet installed like Cinebench or anything, but I will do that once I get to like a complete system showcase because I this is kind of just a work in progress video at the moment just showing off hey I've got like overclocking working I can show you I've got internet working over Wi-Fi no less or no less so give it a moment while it opens up Supermium which is a Chromium backport for Windows XP this is almost the latest version of Chromium, but, you know, for Windows XP. And yeah, I do not have really anything else installed at the moment. It's purely just the tools here. Give it a moment. I... I'm using a mechanical hard drive, so it, it tends to take a while to open Chromium or Supermium. But in the meantime, you can see that we are using almost none of the CPU at the moment while we are loading it up. So we are very much constrained by the hard drive as far as load times go right now. Oh yeah, and we also have four gigs of memory installed, which is the maximum supported, you know, under 32 bit without using PAE. I do want to try and get a pair of four gig DDR2 SODIMs to see if I can really crank this thing beyond what it's me normally meant to handle, but those things are expensive. I've already sunk like $30 into this. $30 for the CPU motherboard combo, I mean. The RAM itself, thankfully, was much cheaper. <laughs> anyway, yeah. So, one of the big quirks about this as well is that if you try and load, for example, a YouTube video... Let's switch open this back up. If you try and load up a YouTube video in Supermium, when it's running at 195 megahertz FSB. It, so far from what I've tested, is guaranteed to crash the page. So give it a moment here. I'm about to load up my GPU June 4 launch video that I posted not too long ago. Hopefully there's not an ad that pops up, but I think it'll probably crash the page before that happens because of that very slight instability. Yep, looks like we're going to load an ad. So, you know, for... Oh, is it not crashing? It's actually handling modern web browsing decently okay for... Oh, yeah, there's a crash. Yeah, so it... Just a little bit too unstable when running at 205 megahertz FSB, so... If I lower it just a little bit further down to 190 instead and reload, we should be able to... Yeah, okay, so it's loading an ad right now, but maybe I should have installed the ad blocker. Get ad. Yeah, so now at 190 megahertz FSB, it is running perfectly fine. And if I open up Stats for Nerds, it's at 360p right now, but 
you know, playback is actually pretty decent. I can do 720p with some dropped frames. You can see the numbers going up pretty quickly there. And especially if I start moving things around, it really chugs. But for a 18 year old CPU that's been overclocked, it is doing quite well. It is, you know, maxed out and everything as well, obviously. But it's doing a lot better than I thought that it was going to do. And hopefully later on when I start doing some much crazier stuff and sticking, you know, a GTX 980 here, it might be able to do even better. So anyway, yeah, it's able to, you know, do modern web stuff just fine as long as you are at 190 megahertz. 195 is stable enough to do benchmarking, but not web browsing. And at 190 megahertz, if I remember correctly, that puts the CPU right around, I think, 2.66 gigahertz as well. So it's a bit of a step down, but you know what? If it's stable, I'm not gonna complain that much. I've already tried loosening the timing even more, but it did not like that. Also, just a little bit of a hint for stuff that we might eventually do later on in this possible series, exploring the most powerful 32-bit only system from Intel. Like, I am very interested in what I can do with this, because I don't have a 3.4 gigahertz Pentium 4 to test it with, so I wouldn't be able to tell, because those things are kind of pricey. But I'm pretty sure that at 2.6-ish, 2.7-ish gigahertz, the Core Duo here should be able to maybe outcompete it. But in any case, that's it for this part of the, I guess, new series on exploring it. In the meantime, I'm going to start installing this graphics card and just getting things set up for the next video. Anyway, yeah, see ya. Bye. So I was about to start recording the next part here. Because, you know, I've got Minecraft up and running and all. But I forgot one key detail from my previous running Minecraft on a 32-bit system video. And it is the reason why I used Windows 7 and not Windows XP back then. It is because one core API for Windows XP, while it is quite good in its current form, is still somewhat bugged. So for example, Supermium is not working. And so I decided for the heck of it, let's install Microsoft Edge and Firefox instead. But more importantly, Java 21 works just enough to get Minecraft to start gener generating a world. But the moment that you actually load into the world, it will crash. It's just a full guarantee that's going to crash the moment it reaches 100% and tries to get you into a world. So give it a moment. I'm going to pull up the console. Put that there. Yeah, watch the, the console. And there we go, it crashed. So if you go look at the console here, it says no core dump written, mini dumps are not enabled, or let's see. Um, yeah, okay. The crash happened outside of the Java virtual machine in native code. More specifically, it's something to do with kernel32.dll, which is one of the files that gets patched when installing one core API. So, unfortunately, this these past several days of just 
updating Windows XP, installing all sorts of stuff. Well, it's actually not all that much at all, but still, installing a bunch of stuff. And it was all for nothing. So I'm going to make a disk image of Windows XP here in case if I do want to come back for it for some other thing. And probably install Windows 7 instead. Just because I know that that version will work for sure. And I guess in that case it'll also give a better comparison against the... I think it was a 2.6 GHz Pentium 4. So I can once again overclock it a bit. And get it up to around 2.6 GHz. So that then we have a comparison directly against the single core Pentium 4. Anyway, yeah, that is mildly disappointing, but it is what it is, so yeah. Next video, I guess, is gonna still take a little while longer.